I'm Scott Wolpert, University of Maryland Mathematics Professor Emeritus. At Maryland, I have contributed to the design of our calculus curriculum and served as associate chair, department chair, and associate dean. And actually, uh, I'm enjoying being retired. <laughs> this program is sponsored by Tipsy Math. Tipsy was founded in 2013 by Philip Griffiths in response to a call from the Carnegie Corporation of New York for the mathematics community to be a design partner for post-secondary mathematics education. Tipsy's vision is post-secondary education in mathematics will enable all students, regardless of their identity, background, or chosen program of study, to develop the modern mathematical knowledge and skills they need for productive engagement in society and the workforce. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jim Gates. Jim holds the Clark Leadership Chair in Science in, on our campus. It, he's in the Physics Department, and he's also affiliated with our School of Public Policy. Jim served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. More in, on this in a bit. In 2012, Jim was elected the President of the American, oh, sorry, sorry. In 2012, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society, and in 2013, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and received the National Medal of Science. In 2021, Jim was president of the American Physical Society. The American Physical Society is physicists catching on to our idea and I'll describe that as follows. So the AMS was founded in 1888. The American Physical Society was founded in 1899, 11 years later. But we, we won't make an issue out of that, Jim. Jim and I first met when studying string theory at a time that our hair was not multicolored. And on, Jim, on occasion, Jim describes himself as a fallen mathematician. So, let Jim, welcome, and let's jump into our conversation. So I'm gonna actually, this is gonna be an interview and, of sorts, and um, I'll start with the first questions. What lessons have you learned on energizing faculty collaboration on curriculum? Well, first of all, it's nearly impossible. That's the most important thing to understand. And all, microphone is, uh, can you guys get the level up on the microphone? You, I have to talk louder. Wow, I heard that order. Uh, so as I was saying, the first lesson is it's nearly impossible and uh, it's one of those issues of ab abandon hope all ye who enter these portals. But the second step is you have to listen very, very intently to what a faculty is talking about, where a faculty is. And the really interesting thing in causing change is that you have to get people's buy-in. In academe, there are no levers where you can hold a cudgel over your colleagues and make them do something. What you can do is offer them a pathway to what they want because essentially all of our colleagues want to be successful. And so if you can show people how to be successful, you can have uh, some leverage in getting things to happen. How do you ensure, or how do we ensure that our core curriculum, how do we ensure, sorry, our core curriculum in an evolving education landscape? So that's a very difficult question. Um, as Scott mentioned, I uh, was on the advisory panel to President Obama when we wrote a report on education reform. And as a consequence, uh, for about two or three years later, I was persona non grata in every math department that I visited. Because that report had in it 
a statement, a very provocative statement, that maybe the education of mathematics is not best done by mathematicians. And so you can see where that goes. Uh, and so the creation of Tipsy was a dream. Uh, transforming post-secondary education was something that we at least conceptually had put in the report, although uh, it was envisioned that perhaps the government would play a stronger role. But as mentioned by Scott, Phil Griffiths and uh, our other senior colleague, um, Brit Kerwin, Brit Kerwin uh, saw, saw the vision and the need. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, let me say some things about you folks and what is your, uh, your uh, wheelhouse. To me, mathematics is the most exquisite and exotic human language in existence. Exotic because so few of us speak it well, and I don't include myself among those people who speak it well. Uh, exquisite, well, for example, we believe that if alien life ever emerges intelligently, mathematics will be the only language that we humans use that will successfully bridge that communication gap. So that shows you the power of this construction that we call mathematics. However, there are lots of pressures on this community that I first learned of while I was advising President Obama. It's terribly underfunded. Uh, people don't sort of put in the resources that the community needs to be more effective in many ways. And you might wonder about that because in fact, today a lot of the wealth that we see in IT comes from the use of advanced mathematics. The algorithms that drive some of the most uh, financially successful entities on the planet is embedded in understanding mathematics. This is a reality that is a lot uh, appreciated by many. So in this environment where mathematics is not just this pristine adamantine pursuit that you folks are used to doing, there are pressures now to produce a kind of student that becomes useful in financial generation of wealth. And this is very extraordinary change. The, um, perhaps the most interesting thing from my perspective is what we see when we start talking about data science. And by the way, that's the poster from last year. Uh, Scott actually in, invade upon me to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence this year also, because artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, all of these things are of the same arc. Namely, they are bringing to bear technologies that can produce results. Everyone's familiar with that. However, and in fact, they're moving beyond that. We can see that, for example, uh, with uh, some mathematicians are starting to use uh, information technology to figure out at least the beginnings of how to make a theorem. That's an incredible change. And what it sets up is an architecture in the future about what mathematics will be and it will challenge our current paradigms. Many years ago, I made the statement that computers are to mathematics as musical instruments are to music. And if you stop and think about how, what I was talking about, well, in mathematics, for most of the history of the discipline, very powerful symbolic means were used for us to grapple with the world of mathematics. Um, in music, there are scores. In mathematics, as uh, it is used by consumers, people like me who work on string theory and worry about the structure of the universe. The idea of mathematics is a very different one from what you do mostly. And in fact, I claim that we sort of speak a pidgin version of the language, a, a patois, a slang version. And the power of that version is that it lets us be innovative, that we can think of new mathematical ideas that have not come from your community. And in fact, this is part of a historical arc. Uh, for example, you know, harmonic analysis is something that you know, is very well understood 
But in some sense, harmonic analysis also goes back to Fourier series and thinking about how to describe waves. So this is a perfect example of how the, the slang version of something generates something that's exceedingly dip, deep when mathematicians actually get involved. So what did I mean about music and mathematics and computers? Well, in music, you can learn music by studying scores and learning, taking a lot of practice. But there are musicians who don't know how to read scores at all. And among some of these people who don't know how to read the scores for music, there are being people who are considered geniuses because of the way that they innovate with the music. And that's the thing that I realized about 15 years ago was likely to be the future in mathematics. That at some point, as we humans continue to interact with computers, they're gonna be like musical instruments. And you can well imagine that there will be some young person who through playing with computers will come to an extraordinarily deep level of understanding mathematics. And this young person or persons is not going to be, be versed in the use of our symbolic language that we're so used to. And so that's one danger that I had, it's a danger and an opportunity that I first spoke about in 2005, actually. And now we've moved even beyond that because I call it that computer-aided conceptualization. With artificial intelligence, there's the danger of computer-driven innovation in mathematics, namely that AI may well be a technology that for the first time in the history of our species is able to innovate <coughs> deeply in the discipline of mathematics. So machine learning, AI, data science, these are the challenges that your community is gonna face because the outside communities, businesses, consumers like me, we're going to want this powerful mathematics and we may not want it the way you're used to teaching it and that's the big challenge. Jim served on President, as already mentioned, President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. <coughs> Excuse me. And participated in the 2012 report, Engage to Excel. Our, our nation, so the original part of the original charge was how would our nation produce an additional one million STEM graduates? The report called for empirically validating our teach empirically validating, sorry, our teaching practices and a national experiment in post-secondary math education. And as already mentioned, TIPSI was founded in response to this call. Since Engage to Excel, so Jim, since Engage to Excel, what additional educational challenges are facing the science and math community today? Well, uh, I sort of spoke about the, the uh, evolution of where mathematics is becoming increasingly connected to um, financial organizations and corporations and businesses. And one of the things that we see and in fact, in string theory, since you mentioned it earlier, we've actually been seeing this for about two decades, namely that some of our best students who have studied string theory wind up going to Wall Street. And of course, that means that when you fail as a string theorist, you can come a multi, become a multimillionaire, which is an interesting definition of failure you know, from my perspective. And so one of the pressures that we, at least as physicists, see among students that we would like to attract to our discipline is that we see the pressures that they are under because of the possibilities of gaining so much more in terms of finance, security, life trajectory. And in fact, there are some students who have done, who've done something very interesting I've experienced, which is uh, go to a financial concern, make a lot of money, uh, retire early, and then come back and do theoretical physics. This is a model that didn't exist when I was young. And this kind of approach 
for people who have a deep love for an intellectual discipline like mathematics or theoretical physics, I can imagine that this is going to become more and more popular. And therefore, the battle that we will be having is how do we keep these bright young people so that at the end of the day, we reach both their goals and our goals. What are our goals? We want to produce humanity's best, deepest understanding of these disciplines, whether it be mathematics or whether it be theoretical physics. And steering young people to that goal is going to be much more complicated. Jim, what lessons about community change did you take away from being president of the American Physical Society? So uh, I served in 2021 as the president of the American Physical Society. And I used to call friends and say, you know, this is the hardest thing I've done since I advised President Obama in the period from 2009 to 2016. Emotionally, it felt like I was riding a three-story tall bicycle. And if you don't think that's hard, try riding one. And so the biggest thing that I think is a challenge to academic society leaderships is when the societies that we, the larger societies that we're part of, are roiled by controversial and controversial, controversial events and controversy. How do we in academic societies like the American Physical Society or the American Mathematical Society, how do we respond, especially to our youngest members? Because it was completely clear while I was president of the American Physical Society that the youngest members entering that organization want to have these organizations be very forward leaning in expressing a set of values that they approve of. And so one of the things that I always used to say while I was president is I was listening very, very intently to try to find the centroid in this organization because there are these forces. We all want to encourage young people to come in because that's where our vitality and sustainability come from. So we can't afford to ignore what they want. On the other hand, some of us with you know, multicolor hair, as Scott described it, uh, we've learned a thing or two about the way the world works. And so melding these two forces together, that's the thing that I thought was the most interesting experience for my presidency. And I came away even before, well, as I initiated my presidency, I outlined some things that I would use as guide stars. And one of them is that it's been said that for individuals, character is destiny. For organizations, I have become convinced that culture is destiny. And so we wrestle with this issue of culture change. In the APS, we actually initiated a mechanism by which the leadership can directly converse in this. We called it Delta Phi for changing physics. It's an effort to ask three questions by the leadership, and then to reflect upon those, two, those three questions in conversation with the general membership. The qu first question is, what is it that are the values that we espouse as being our principles of operating? Second question, what is the empirical data in our practices um, in terms of going forward? And third question, if there's a misalignment between, between the answers to the first and second questions, how shall we make sure that um, harmony comes into existence? So these are things that I worked very diligently on my term as the American Physical Society president. And I'm happy to tell you that the current president, uh, Dr. Youngki Kim of the University of Chicago, has just initiated a new set of discussions that we will be engaging in in the APS about this issue of culture change. And so I would commend that as a possible uh, pathway for more scientific organizations. Moving on, what educational opportunities do data science and AI present to 
to our fields. So, and I, I, I alluded to, to me the most astounding one was using AI to help me, I don't do this, but if I was a mathematician, using AI to help me figure out theorems. Not just the proof of a theorem, but what theorems are possible. This is a, a very astounding um, possibility. And so one of the challenges, I think, will be for real mathematicians, namely you, as opposed to me, to figure out how to leverage uh, AI in particular in this extraordinarily new way of conceptualization and, uh, and um, actualization of creating a broader, a more rapidly evolving theoretical, theorem-based approach to describing how mathematics works. Those are actually all our um, prepared questions. We had planned to allow time for questions from the audience. So in fact, we're now at that point. Are there questions? Is there a microphone? Oh, on the sides, the two sides, there are microphones. Hello, professors. Thank you for this discussion. Uh, I am a TA, and last semester I had a co I taught a course on proof-based mathematics. It was introductory proof course for undergrads. Now, first few homeworks, I saw that all of them were so perfectly written that even when I was an undergrad, I never could have thought about writing in that way. Later, I figured out all the proofs were from ChatGPT. And now that you, the, the discussion is about what challenges does data science, and I include AI to that also, present to math education. So, don't you think that using like the AI in this way, and you, we cannot detect that they are from the AI except for the gut feeling. So isn't it going to like destroy the mathematical creativity among the undergrads? Thank you. That's a very interesting question and also one that we see in my discipline in a slightly uh, different way. <clears throat> so when I was in graduate school uh, and I finished in 77 from MIT, uh, there was a standard curriculum that all graduate physicists went through, and one of the pillars of, the, of that curriculum is the study of um, electromagnetism. For electromagnetism, for decades in this country and around the world, there was a premier textbook by, written by A.J. Jackson of the University of California, Berkeley. And the way that people learned electromagnetism was by doing homework assignments from that text. And so, as a physics professor, I had been used to saying, do problem, chapter seven, problems three, six, and five, or something like that. And um, when the results came back in, uh, I could have a sense of confidence that the students presenting those results had actually worked through the problems. About 15 years, no, 10 years ago, that comfort disappeared. Because you see, not only did the book Jackson go online, but the solutions to Jackson problems went online. And so now, the, there is a, in fact, we don't have a good answer to this. And your question is akin to that. Namely, as more and more people get access to modern, high-powered uh, computational information technology uh, platforms, how, do we edu how can we be assured that the assessment tools that we use, and typically that's homework or what have you, how can we be assured that the young people that we're teaching are the, and they don't have to be young, any of our students, because we have returning students, how can we be assured that they have actually done the work? Because we all know, all of us in these kinds of disciplines, we all know from our life experience that unless you do the work, unless you practice your scales, to use a, a musical analogy, Unless you do that, there are going to be holes in your intellectual engagement of the discipline. And I, at this point, I don't know any good answers to that. I, I know what I try to do is to, it's a more expensive thing, which is to, 
more, have more bi-directional conversations with the students. And of course, there's only one of me, so that you can see what the problem is. But that's the only thing that I can think about, is that there has to be a, a finer tool for probing individuals as they master these kinds of uh, theoretical and uh, disciplinary subjects. Thank you, Professor. Taking off just for a moment on the bi-directional, one thought that occurs to me is we can give our students an incorrect, putative solution and say to them, what's wrong with this approach? But certainly, I was thinking of it more in a mechanical way, but I was thinking, yes, that certainly the problems we grew up on, where it's, there's a statement and it wants you to produce it and that's the end, that, yeah, particularly won't work. Yes. So the kind of creative, creativity that you just talked about, which I call auditing, because that's something we also do, namely make, a, make an intentionally false statement or a series of statements and then ask the individual students to discover what is the failure point of this. If it's a proof, where does this fail? Because the only way a student's going to get there is that each individual student has actually got to work through the process. So the auditing is possibly one way forward. Abby. Sorry. Uh, Hi, I'm Abby Herzig. Uh, just in response to that, I, I've heard of classes where the professor requires students to submit their solution at the same time as submitting the chat GPT solution side by side, which I thought was a very clever uh, way yes. around that. And then we'll take a qu question over here. So you, you described um, uh, physicists as speaking pigeon mathematics, and I'd like to push back against that a little bit. Are you a as, physicist? I, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Which plays into the stereotype that we mathematicians are the keepers of rigor, and physicists do quote unquote sloppy mathematics. My wife is a physicist. And she describes mathematicians as teaching students to be careful, and physicists as teaching students to be brave. To do what to be that? brave. To be brave. To take risks. So we lie to, a lot. I'm curious if you could expand on, on this theme a little bit. So let me jump in just for a second. Jim, I didn't tell you there are a number of plants in the audience. <laughs> So I agree with your wife's assessment, I certainly didn't mean to insult her, um, that you know, we, kind of, we take a lot of chances, we fit this in terms of what we do mathematically, because um, we will jump to an answer where there's not a complete logical stream that connects the starting point to the answer. But you see, the other thing that this is something perhaps the majority of this audience won't like, but I'm going to say it anyway. But you see, mathematicians typically learn mathematics from other mathematicians. Physicists learn mathematics from Mother Nature, and our teacher is smarter. <laughs> and so this jumping, this incomplete use of logic as we, as we go someplace, if we, get the, uh, if we get the wrong answer, Mother Nature smacks our hands. Uh, regarding students using uh, generative AI to uh, bypass various <coughs> homework and whatnot, uh, it, this feels a lot like back in elementary school when our teachers tell us don't use calculators. calculators. Um, and in truth, there is a very good reason as to why they don't uh, tell us to not use them, but at the same time, I'm willing to bet everybody in this room has used a calculator because once you know how to do it, um, it, it's a good way of bypassing that. Uh, I'm not, uh, how different is that really from just telling um, students in college, uh, don't use AI uh, for your homework? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah, they can cheat their way through it, uh, but then how many of those are going to go on to become graduate students 
in mathematics. Uh, one other point, and this is uh, slightly related, but um, you were discussing students who uh, could do mathematics but don't necessarily know the, uh, all the symbolism and the rigor. Uh, a lot of the tools being generated right now are actually very good for bridging that gap. Uh, it's been over 10 years since I've written a paper. I'm writing one right now, and the first thing I do if I don't know how to write something in LaTeX is just go to ChatGPT and say, how do I write this in LaTeX? Um, is, that, is it possible that uh, generative AI in particular is going to be able to help in a lot of those situations. So it, I have never been someone who supported the statement, don't let students use calculators. When they first came in, it was clear to me uh, that there were advantages. The way I always think about technology, you see these things on my face here? They let me see better. And so why would I tell someone, don't wear your glasses? Technology, to me, always has that possible positive benefit. So I've, I've always wondered why, for example, if you go even into elementary school, why do we make students memorize uh, multiplication tables anymore? This is a question I've wondered about for decades because nobody in the real world is gonna to have to remember how to multiply numbers given the ubiquity of technological resources. So I, I'm, I'm, how do I say it? I am not someone who says, don't tell the students to use these kinds of tools. And in fact, like you, I'm starting to learn how, although I've been LaTeXing for years, chat BTC, he can do it faster than I can. Thank you. Then let's have a question over here. Hi, thank you for the wisdom and everything you've said so far. I work in the K-12 world and sometimes I get students as young as middle school say, who are very adept at STEM and you would think These, this student's gonna be a mathematician or a physicist or something and then they talk about it even at the young age of I'm gonna go make my billions on Wall Street and they're like 12 years old and I'm wondering if you have any hope to offer a student in um, pursuing um, math or physics when they're already thinking about Wall Street at a really young age? So, hope, let's see, H-O-P-E, I guess. Um, well, first of all, I, one of my principles in life is we must always have hope or else there's no, no hope for the future, right? We, to me, uh, hope is an, is an essential ingredient to get to a better future. So we, I, I struggle to maintain hope, but at the end of the day, my position is we've got to find a way. So as you mentioned, there are young people who, at very young ages who have understood that mathematics can lead to millions, right? And they tell you they're gonna build these great corporations and be entrepreneurs. Um, they wanna become Elon Musk or you know, uh, some of the other giants that we see in the tech world. But I, so let me say it this way. I think there are kind of, we're talking about a couple of different audiences, so let me talk about my own personal story for a moment. I was four years old when I told my parents I wanted to become a scientist. And uh, there are kids, as you well know, that for whatever reason, at a very precocious stage of their life, they kind of know what they want to do. And so that kind of child, I think, will not in general be drawn to the financial rewards because they are doing something that is deeply involved in who they are as a person. On the other hand, you will get a larger group of people obviously who will have some mathematical ability and see a way to leverage that to a better life. If they are genuinely engaged in mathematics, I think that's a net plus for our society. So I'm not gonna be critical of them, and I'm gonna to try to enable, as I encounter students like that, I try to enable their, their vision of the future too. I think as a society, the more people we get to understand mathematics, I think that raises the level of our society as a whole. Thank you. Michael. 
Yeah, okay. That's a, one of those plants. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Hi, Jim. Uh, yeah, so I'm Michael Dorf. I think it's good for people to introduce themselves to that helps people get to know other people. Um, I'm not a plant, but uh, one thing that I've, I've always wondered about, it's getting away from the AI and the data science issue, but um, before I, I got my PhD in math, um, I would read these, I'd see these books that would talk about the beauty of mathematics, and I'd look at the author, and the authors would be physicists, not mathematicians. <laughs> and some of, the, some of the best books, or the ones that seem to be the most popular, uh, that try to promote um, or popularize mathematics are done by physicists. Now, there are a few people in this audience. Um, uh, I see Tim Chartier over here, who does a wonderful job in promoting and popularizing mathematics. And I would love to be, you know, to help get into that, that uh, stage, maybe when I retire or something. But what is it about physicists that make them um, maybe more able or, or something, thinking about this more than we do as mathematicians? And, and this relates then to a second thought. <laughs> um, and that is, in, in, with the fact, with the PCAST report that came out, I, from what I remember, one of the things was the idea that um, one of the leads on there was also, I think, a physicist, or maybe the discussion was on that the physicists are so good at promoting active learning, um, and the mathematicians, at least looking at some of the, maybe the traditional R1s in, in mathematics community, are more lecture-oriented. Um, so what is it about physicists or, or do, that allows them to maybe think more about the people than the content, both in, the, in popularizing their books and also in, in teaching? And is there something that we could learn? So I guess here's the main question. Is there something we could learn as mathematicians from physicists that would help us be better in working with people and popularizing mathematics? Wow. That's why I called him a plant. Just wait, I have another one out there too. So Michael, you, uh, let me take a stab at trying to provide a rational answer to your question. As a physicist, I am peculiarly aware that I am caught between two worlds. One is the world, world of mathematics that to me is one of the most beautiful things intellectually I have encountered in my life and the world of Mother Nature at the deepest levels, gravity, elementary particle physics, uh, string theory, these are the things that you know, have been my sustenance intellectually. And as I look at my colleagues who do these sorts of things, I think what happens is because we're constantly being bounced back and forth between these two worlds, it gets us to re ask a lot of questions. But the other thing that I think plays a, a really very distinctive role in this is that as I look at physicists and compare them to mathematicians, there is this really strange thing about intuitive leaps. Now it's not that mathematicians don't make intuitive leaps because one of my great heroes is Ramanujan, who I think of as the greatest exemplar of the fact that mathematics comes from our subconscious. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this story, but it, just an incredible human being. And it's clear that his dreams were generating the mathematics that he was doing. And in physics, we see, I think we see a lot more direct evidence of that sort of thing. And so as we start talking about the beauty, it's this tapping into this wellspring of what sits inside of us uh, subconsciously. I'm not a, not a neuroscientist, but I've been told that for the average human, the, if you look at the amount of data on a daily basis that we process in our conscious mind and compare that to the amount of data that our subconscious actually processes, that it's orders of magnitude difference in terms of what's going on with us at the subconscious level. And so if physicists are tapping into that to do what the conscious mind does, I think you get a more robust view of what it, be, it means to be human, quite frankly. 
And I think that's part of why we may be more successful. Please. Uh, please. Yes, uh, my name is Jonathan Johnson at uh, Oklahoma State. And so as big data and AI is used more and more in higher education, in particular higher math education, a uh, couple of concerns is the propensity for these systems to give incorrect information or lie and, and do it boldly and, and stand firm on whatever they tell you, right? And so uh, I'd like to you to address as students are learning to live in this world where they have these tools, uh, how should we think about the challenge of uh, training students to think about the <coughs> ethics of using AI as a tool and how to think about what the limitations of, what, of using AI uh, have for advancing knowledge? Another plant, huh? I by no means think of myself as the oracle of Delphi capable of answering all questions at the <laughs> drop of a hat. However, the question you raise about uh, the use of modern information technology is far larger than just students. And we can see the consequences of that in our politics these days. Um, if we, I mean, you are an exalted group. You're very exceptional. As I said, you're the true speakers of this exquisite and exotic language of mathematics. For 99.999999% of the world, you folks are, be, are aliens effectively. And so if the society as a whole is failing, in my opinion, to understand the validation of information that, an individ that individuals receive, I don't know how to fight against that within the confines of our smaller world. And I, the only thing I can think of is that there has to be a cost attached to faulty logic as one proceeds along these kinds of technical disciplines. In engineering, it's completely clear what that cost will be. Someone's gonna sue your corporation, right? And so we, I think, have to think about a system as we are educating pe young people of, of not only offering um, carrots, but there have to be some sticks involved, I believe. Please. Hi, yeah, my name is Ethan Shade. Um, I'm a math education major from the University of Dayton, and I'm teaching a high school stats class this coming spring for students who do not intend to pursue a career in STEM later on. And these students, uh, from one way or another, were discouraged from math, uh, most likely through struggling with computation. So in this class, we use many applets online or other data science tools to perform most of the stats in this class. Uh, for these students, what would you hope that they are able to take out of into their everyday life so that they're still mathematically or statistically literate for um, their careers moving forward? So um, thank you for the question. I'm currently teaching a course, and this is my second year doing it uh, at the University of Maryland called the Manhattan Project. And it's about exactly what you think, the development of atomic weapons. Um, this course, uh, the class I just taught uh, has uh, 79 students in it. And most of these students are not gonna be STEM majors. And so whenever I'm in that situation what I try to do for my students and what I would hope and encourage you to do is to not concentrate on the fact of trying to get them to the point where they're going to remember some detail about the mathematics. When I teach this course, my main goals are I want to teach young people how science works, not necessarily what science has done. I want to teach them that science is fallible because it's done by humans and to get young students to understand, at least in the physical sciences, that we talk about error bars and that that is a quantization of the imperfection in our knowledge and that all knowledge 
about the physical world always comes with error bars. This is a distinct difference in mathematics. Your error bars are zero. <laughs> and so it is more, that actually puts a barrier up for people, at least in my opinion, when, because it's asking people to be per perfect. And to me, that's a really high ask. So I would say concentrate on the things that allow your students to appreciate what mathematics does, the power of mathematics, and that they should not fear mathematics. Those are the, sort of the primary things that I do when I teach this class. I don't want them to fear physics. I don't want them, I don't want them to think of it as something that's unapproachable. I want them to think of it as something that if they, they're not going to do it, if they would spend enough time, they could get pretty good at it. Kate. Hi, Kate Stevenson. I'm the chair of the math department at Cal State Northridge, but my first job was University of Maryland. Go so, Terps. Go Terps. So I have a question that came to my mind as you were discussing academic careers and people leaving to go and make money and possibly coming back. I have two reflections that I'd like really both of you to, uh, to think about and maybe share your, your ideas on. Uh, so as a chair of a large regional master's granting university, uh, some of our students are going on to get a PhD, but many are going on to be teachers and to go out into industry, and we really struggle to help students make that jump to industry because that's not what we do. That's not where we live. And then I tie that to your experience of people leaving physics to go and then to come back and my own experience being married to somebody who does AI uh, and now works part-time for Amazon and part-time for Caltech, something that was impossible, right? A genera half a generation ago. You had two years that you could go off and work in industry, the Kissinger rule, and then you, could, then you had to decide to come back. That's not happening anymore. Do you see the, an evolution now of the academic career, and where do you see the advantages and the risks in that? I'm going to let you go first. I didn't hear the full question. Uh, Scott says, could you repeat the question? <laughs> or tell me the brief of it. No, the brief of the evolution of academic, of academic careers because now people can be hired in industry and actually. Right. That bad, huh? So I was afraid that was the question. <laughs> yes, times have dramatically changed. We, um, I won't name names, we have a, we have a mathematician colleague who has a very distinguished career and one of her children works for Google, and another works for maybe Facebook, and this colleague's a f very intense academic, and I risked matters and said to her, what her children are doing might be more interesting than what we do. And she said, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and this is coming from someone who's a very intense academic. Um, yeah, I'm going to say I don't, I, well, at least for the moment, I don't have an answer because um, ev even in my own case, uh, daughter, we have one daughter who's a full techie, and she worked for Uber for a while. And they were looking at optimization, and she started, she only has a bachelor's in math. She started asking me about optimization in monarch spaces. Mm -hmm. And because this had come up in Uber's calculations. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, so I'll just take a maybe step. So maybe in the direction that Jim mentioned earlier, we need to have it that there's not this big moat between industry and the academy. Because if there, I'll pose if there is a big moat, we're probably, if the academy could come up short on that arrangement. And so that this, this is my one thought. Well, <clears throat> I have a, a set of twins, a boy and a girl. And um, my daughter is finishing her third year as a postdoc at Princeton. 
She studies uh, electromagnetic signatures from infalling matter around spinning black holes. My son is about a year or so away from his PhD. He's a boy after all, they're twins, but he's a boy. And uh, he looks like he's headed to be becoming a um, biophysicist. So, you know, I, 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 in some sense, I'm in this conversation <laughs> that you're having within my own family about what I think about academe and what they should do. And I, I don't ever try to be prescriptive when I talk to my children because I know whatever prescription I give them, they'll do the opposite. Uh, but I do share my thoughts. And so, um, as Scott said, I think, as an, someone who has spent their entire career in academia, I think we are going to have to change or we will become losers, quite frankly. I think there needs to be an increased porosity between what is done in academe and what is done outside of academe, especially, um, you know, the deep study of mathematics has been sort of one of our things. Um, but as I said, with information technology, it's, I think it's likely that people outside of traditional academe are going to be able to make astounding contributions to these deep intellectual endeavors. Please. Okay, just, just a little pushback about the fluency, uh, about uh, the multiplication tables. I think they can be a path towards um, learning, but they are towards understanding uh, later mathematics, even if they aren't uh, necessarily always taught that way. But my question is sort of a, maybe a little bit of a follow-up on this theme. You said um, mathematics was the most underfunded. I didn't say most, I said extraordinarily. Extraordinary. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, but most of the wealth in IT comes from mathematics. Um, we've, it's not clear that a lot of policymakers see uh, a lot of value in maintaining mathematics. I think of the University of Western Virginia math department. Uh, could you comment on that? I'm sorry, what was the end could of that? Could you comment on um, the perceptions of uh, policy Comments. makers? Sure. Well, you're right. Uh, you know, we uh, read about the closing of mathematics departments. I think it's the University of West Virginia, West Virginia University has closed their graduate program. Exactly. So, you know, we read about this all the time. And this is where, when I first started thinking about policy issues back in 2009 uh, for President Obama, this is one of the things that I guess I was stunned to understand about the mathematics community. Back after the Second World War, there was a mathematician named von Neumann who was very influential in, among policymaking circles in DC and was able to enunciate the value of um, mathematics, coming, of course, from the fact that our country had developed uh, atomic weapons. So von Neumann, uh, I can't remember the year he died, but the point is that the influence that he had among um, national level policymakers has never been replicated as far as I can tell. And this was the thing that astounded me uh, in 2009 when I first started thinking about policy, um, the interface of policy and the STEM disciplines, the fact that that capacity has never been replicated by this community. And it's not that no one has tried, but there's, as I study the record, no one has been successful. This is a major problem from my perspective. I do not have a solution for this problem. In closing, actually, I want to connect, I'd like to connect two matters that Jim mentioned to prior uh, addresses in, at this meeting. So I don't know which lectures Jim has been to, so I'll just, shh, shh. So I'll just say, so um, Terry Tao spoke about new uses of computers for proofs and that, that, that it's moving into 
whole new era. And then yesterday, Yvonne Lai spoke about building bridges between mathematician researchers and mathematic educators. And her, one of her primary messages was listening. With that, I'd like to thank you, Jim, very much for doing this. And I think